for error. Now on BBC One, it's over live to Nick Ross and Fiona Bruce for this month's edition of Crime Watch UK. Barrington Williams was a decent bloke on a night out with his sister and a friend when someone sprayed 17 bullets at their car from a submachine gun. The whole community needs to know who pulled that trigger. Good evening and welcome to Crime Watch. 17 shots and all fired in the open street by whoever murdered Barrington and injured one of his friends. There's a huge reward. Let's see if we can solve this before the night is out. We start on Tyneside with a story that shocked the whole country just after Christmas. A six-year-old girl was playing in her bath, talking through the wall to her mum, who was tidying up the front room, when a stranger walked in the back door, snatched up the little girl, put his hand over her mouth and took her away. I'm just going to check on the van. I'll be there in a minute. Are you all right in there, sweetheart? Sweetheart? Well, I've just uh, finished watching Poirot on TV and uh, I walked through to knock the kettle on. Uh, I heard her scream. I rushed straight out and that's when I saw the little girl standing over there in the, in the little alcove there, completely naked, freezing cold. I didn't know what the hell to think. Of course, I, I rushed straight over and, and I tried to comfort her. I, I tried to find out what was wrong and she'd said that um, she'd been playing in the bath with with her Christmas toys and a man had came in and picked her up and took her away. Um, we cannot understand how anybody could do this to a little girl. Um, it's absolutely shocking. Absolutely shocking. So the girl was only with her abductor for 10, maybe 15 minutes. Um, it doesn't seem like a long time, but 10, 15 minutes to be repeatedly sexually, sexually assaulted is a terrible experience. The little girl's been a really good witness uh, despite her, her, her age. She once got lost when she was out with her mother and her mother's given her advice about picking out buildings and landmarks. So she's been able to pick out buildings when she's been in the route with the abductor. Adrian Road here, which is westbound towards Wall's End and returning into Point Pleasant Industrial Estate. And this is where the, the, the little girl describes um, the place where the man may have stopped. She describes grey factories with red windows, and in this estate we've got grey factories with red windows. So the next... Uh, building that the girl recognised was up on her right hand side is the quick save supermarket and she was able to direct us up Park Road towards Walls End and do the look back towards Wellington Quay. I just turned right onto Walls End High Street and it may have been the car was driving along here in a sort of erratic or excessive speed. And from here she could either go one or two ways. One of them is down Ropery Lane, or the other way is up the hill, up the bank behind me, towards Tynemouth Road. The fact that uh, there's lots of dead ends in back lanes, you know, that, that could suggest that it was a local man. However, Tyne Tunnel is a matter of a few hundred metres away, 
and that would give access to the A19 and any offender could quite quickly be either north or south away from the area. This is, this is where they abandoned her on a cold, dark night on her own. I mean, Jim, the astonishing thing about this case is that a man could work out that the little girl was alone in the bath and he thought he could get into the house, take her out of a bath, take her out of the house without anyone noticing him. I mean, what kind of man are you looking for? Well, for me, that suggests it's a local man, or at least somebody with local knowledge. Not necessarily a resident, but somebody that's familiar with the area and has maybe been so able to do Shields some... the North Shields area? Exactly, and maybe been able to do some pre-planning. Unfortunately, in terms of description, it, it's very brief and very scant, because we're talking about a six-year-old victim here. But she does describe a white male dressed almost entirely in black, including a black hat and black gloves. Now, he took her out of the house, took her on a journey in his car lasting some 15 minutes. There's two cars in particular you're interested in. Yes, I'm interested in a, a, a red or maroon hatchback that was seen driving around the back lanes or the roads around Wellington Quay in the hours up to the, the, the crime. Um, but I'm also particularly interested in a, a red saloon described as dirty, scruffy saloon car, possibly an old 3 Series BMW that was seen speeding away from the, the, the Wellington Quay area towards Walls End at around about 7.15 on the 27th of December, which was the, the critical time for me. So obviously what you're after tonight are witnesses who may have seen the man in the area, seen him driving around the area, he paused in two places, we showed the landmarks there in the reconstruction, and putting all these things together, the description such as it is, local knowledge and those cars on that night. Absolutely. If people put the three elements together and they have suspicions about any individual, I would ask them, or I would urge them, please contact us. OK, well, thank you very much indeed, Jim. If you know anything about who this man is, call us here in the studio or call the incident room on 01 661 863 000. Well, if you're involved in making crime much, or involved in watching it, come to that, you're sometimes left as in that Tyneside case, shaking your head at what some people can do to others. The good news, of course, is that there are so many more decent people prepared to do their bit to catch them. And just look what's happened since last month. Before Christmas, we reconstructed the kidnap and torture of a bus driver in South London. Police here in the Crime Watch studio took several calls which gave them a new lead. Two men have now been arrested and charged with kidnap and GBH. We reported last month that a man had been named by Crime Watch viewers in a case of witness intimidation. Well, shortly after the programme, we also got a name of a woman who was said to be his accomplice. Together, they're suspected of attacking the mother of a schoolgirl to stop the child giving evidence about a sex offence. Both people suggested by viewers have now been arrested and face charges, including assault, false imprisonment and firearms offences. Thomas Piovesana was wanted in relation to an attack on a police officer in Tamworth. He's since been arrested and charged with GBH. News on an old case solved by advances in DNA as well as good old police persistence. Jasdip Hule has been found guilty of robbery and GBH. We showed the crime almost five years ago, in which a police officer was attacked and sufficiently badly injured for him to still suffer from his injuries. In fact, the judge commended him for his bravery as he sentenced Hule to nine years. Stanley Davis handed himself into police after being featured on Crime Watch last February. He pleaded guilty in court to 22 counts of indecent assault and gross indecency with children. He's been sentenced to 12 years. Fraudster Roseanne Craig was spotted by an estate agent who saw her on Crime Watch last July, the time she was trying to buy a flat from him. As a result, she was arrested and has been sentenced to three and three quarter years. Three years ago on Bonfire Night, Graham and Carol Fisher were shot and bludgeoned to death at their home in Cornwall. It caused a shockwave in the West Country, but after watching our reconstruction, a key witness came forward, naming one of two brothers. <laughs> Lee and Robert Firkin have since been found guilty of the murders, and they'll be sentenced next month. We've had so much progress, in fact, since last time, we're going to have to carry some of it forward to next month. Let's go to our next appeal, and our next villain is a serial offender. Maybe you've seen him, maybe you know him. In fact, maybe he's attacked you too. His victims so far include a woman who was eight months pregnant, a young mum putting her two kids in the car, a disabled woman, a pensioner, and the list goes on. This is what he looks like, recognise him. Certainly all those people he's attacked want him caught before he does something even worse. 
This one man is a walking crime wave. In a warren of streets in southwest London, he's treated residents as if they were cash point machines. In the run up to Christmas, he was very busy. Give me your cash! We know of at least 10 attacks, all confined to a single page of the A to Z. Give me your cash oh, now. I'm pregnant. I don't want to hurt you, baby. Jeez. Give me your cash. Move it. Please, just don't. <laughs> That woman was eight months pregnant, so you can imagine the stress and trauma that she went through. And would you believe it that two days later, a couple of streets away, he goes for another mum? Don't leave anything in the car, all right? Get your bag out. I don't have my bag. I've just been on the school run. Please. I've got my child in the car. Relax. I won't hurt you. Just give me your bag. I haven't got a bag. Don't I've mess just been with on me. the school Shut run. Shut up. Get, get your cash out. Oh, That's all don't I've got. Don't mess with me. What do you have? Have you got a phone? Get your phone out. My four-year-old son was in the car at the time, and he saw everything. We've had to take him to a child psychologist um, because he hasn't been sleeping properly. He thinks the, the robber's going to come back and shoot him and kill him, and he's very, very scared. His next attack was nighttime, a barrister on his way home. <laughs> Don't mess with me, or I'll kill you. Give me your wallet. All right. Get your watch off. Move it! All right. OK. Go that way. Go that way. Get your cash out. There you go. What else you got? Uh, my phone. Give me your phone. I've, I've got a phone, yeah. If you move, I'll stab you. By this stage, he's getting really cocky. His next victim actually sees him next to his own witness appeal board. I'm not going to hurt you. Give me your money and your cards now. I I'm not going to hurt you. Just give me your money. That's all I've got. Give me the rest of the money. That's give me your cards. That, 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 that's, that's... I felt shocked and afraid, obviously. I'd never been in that situation before, and I was so near home, and it was just horrible to think that something like that could happen in, in a quiet road. By November, he's getting particularly nasty, and attacks a 63-year-old who had just got out of a taxi on his way home. <laughs> yeah, Give me your money! Give me your money! I haven't got any! I don't yeah. want to cut you! Roll 20, Vienna. Yeah, give me 20. December the 1st was a particularly busy day for our man. There is a set, kids. You can't get in that bush. I'm going to see. Are you? <laughs> you want to go? A man just attacked me. What? A knife. Where, where did he go? He went that way. Dean, come on! Please give me your phone and your money. Come on. I haven't got anything. Give me the money. Give me the I've money. Got nothing on me. Got give me the cash. Get your nose out. What you got? Pick it up. Pick I'm it sorry. up. Is that the guy? He got away, but he was back at work two weeks later. <laughs> ten weeks, ten victims, hundreds of pounds worth of property, not to mention the misery that he's caused to these people, 
This man needs taken off the street. This is D.I. Jess Ruddle, who's trying to do just that. Get him off the street. He seems a very odd guy. He's prepared to attack people while there are passers-by. He attacks them by, the, uh, by a sign which is appealing about his, his crimes. Is he a bit of a head case? Oh, we're keeping very much an open mind at the moment in relation to whether he's suffering any mental health difficulties, but it's certainly a possibility. And he always seems to be doing this around the same time. I mean, virtually seven days a week, but it's, it's sort of five o'clock-ish, most of all. Yes, the timings we think are very significant. They're between five and six in the afternoon, um, although throughout the offences they've been between two and seven. And every time in that reconstruction, he seems to have a different knife and be different clothes? Different knives, different clothes. Um, he clearly knows the area extremely and well. And it's a very small area of Wandsworth and South London. Very small area. Um, we're talking, as was said on the, on, the, on the film, a page of an A to Z. So anybody who knows him, I mean, how distinctive is he? I mean, I know he's tall and quite slim. He is tall. He's about six foot to six foot three. He's between his late 20s and early 30s. He's of a slim build, um, athletic. Um, and he's also got long pointed features. Someone said he's got starey eyes, is that Yes, right? um, a couple of witnesses said starey, bulgy eyes. So what's he doing in that area? Is it an institution? Is he at college? I mean, what is he doing there? One thing that he took, very distinctive, a Longines watch, um, it's about Longines, isn't it, which is a, a gold watch. What else can you tell us about it? Yes, it's, a, it's an 18 karat gold watch uh, with a gold face and a dark leather strap. On the rear is engraved the initials DS. Well, that's pretty distinctive. If you've seen it, let us know. If you can help, if you think you know who he is, call the incident room on 020-8247-8806. Call us if you've been one of his victims, haven't yet reported it. You can text us if you want. Please put CW for Crime Watch at the front of your message and text it to 83199. A Saturday night out four summers ago in North London, and two friends are out on the town. Along the way, they meet the wrong person, and it cost one of them his life. These two men lying in the road have both been stabbed. After an exchange of words with two other men on Chalk Farm Road, Brian McGarry, who's lying on the left, was stabbed in the thigh. But his friend, Tom Breen, died from a stab wound to the chest. Let's just emphasise, these two witnesses are just that, witnesses. They've done nothing wrong. They were very helpful on the night, and police want them to get in touch. Well, Stephen, you're Tom's son. I mean, tell us a bit about your dad. What was he like? He was just a very special person in our eyes. He was a focal point for our, his immediate family, but also for his entire family circle. He was just a guy who lived life to the full, who, who loved life and had made so many plans for the future, and was just so happy working in London and coming back to Northern Ireland as well. And, and the impact on your mum has been terrible. I mean, it's, what, 30 yeah. years? Then well, 30 married. years they were married. I mean, they lived through the, the troubles, you know, 30 years of, of conflict. And then he, he, he went to London for, for some work and then had made so many plans. My mum made so many trips to London to be with him, to visit him, and they had plans for the future. And then for this to happen has just had a terrible impact on her and also on my grandmother as well because my dad was her firstborn son and it's just hard to, to come to terms with even three and a half years down the line it's hard to believe that we've been robbed of such a, a special person who was um, just so important in all our lives. Now Anthony we saw in the CCTV there two two witnesses one of them has come forward but the man with the ponytail purely as a witness you'd still like to hear from him wouldn't you? We would very much uh, like to speak to him of course yes. He's the one we can see on the right of the screen. Yes, indeed. Uh, it would appear from the CCTV that he's arrived just seconds probably after the incident's happened, so may well have seen who committed the offence. And also we've got a, a picture of, of someone he was talking to in the pub, we can see him on, on the left, uh, the elephant's head. The elephant's head, indeed, yes. And it, they were both of them together, appeared to be talking together, so presuming that they're friends. And, and the key thing is they may have seen, a, they may have seen the killer, may not realise, well, of course, they may yes, have seen the killer that night. Absolutely. They may have left the pub together. If they did, they may, have, may well have seen what happened. and They may not know what they know. What about a letter that was sent through to you, through to the police investigation? It was an anonymous letter, but you would like to speak to the person who wrote it again. We would indeed, yes. It's very, very important for us to speak to whoever the person or persons who wrote that letter to establish exactly how they know what, what they say they know. OK, well, there's a £20,000 reward. So call us here in the studio or call the incident room on 020 8785 8244. Still to come, the mysterious death of teenager Jack McLeod. Left in a park to sober up, four weeks later he was found dead in the River Lee. 
His family and his friends will appeal tonight. How did he get there? But first, DC Rav Wilding has half a dozen characters all up to no good, all caught on camera. That's right, but what I need from you, please, are their names. Opening time, early morning, Haringey Station. But this guy's not here to catch a train. The ticket clerk opens up. He closes in. She struggles with him. He threatens to shoot her. And eventually overpowers her. Safe behind closed doors, he heads for the office before heading off with the cash. Here he is on the station stairs just before the attack. If he talked to you, talk to us. There's a £1,000 reward on this one. Closing time at Coral's The Bookies. As the assistant at their Snenton branch in Nottingham locks up, two punters claim they've left their mobile. But they've brought a knife. They threaten her with it. They want cash. And take £300. They make a mess of their exit, but they make good pictures. Recognise them? PC World, Exeter, enter two very non-PC customers. They look like decent blokes. They're not, they're thieves. They do a decent impression of browsing, followed by a very real act of theft. One lifts laptops, the other opens his coat. Here's their audition picture again. Do you know this double act? A computer game shop in Bradford and a very different routine. The bloke in a cap's a peeping Tom. He's followed a woman into this shop. While she looks at DVDs, he looks up her skirt. Repeatedly. He films her on his mobile, but he's the one on film now. What's his name? If you know any of those six blokes, the number to ring is on your screen. It's just unbelievable, isn't it, what some people will do? Anyway, early in the morning, just over a year ago, staff at a big DIY chain in Sheffield were gearing up for the first customers of the day. People usually go to B&Q to buy the right tools for the job, but on this morning, the first ones in brought their tools with them. DI Andy West takes us through the staff's horrific start to the day. This is the B&Q store at Queen's Road at Sheffield. A year ago, three men turned up here at 10 to 6 in the morning. Now, the store was closed, but these men had got their own ideas for some Christmas shopping. This is the garden section of the store. Now, there's an 18-foot-high fence all the way round, but the men, they brought their own heavy-duty cutting gear. And right here, they made their own out-of-hours doorway. It didn't take the guys long to get into the store. But if they expected it to be deserted, they were very much mistaken. There were 27 people stacking shelves for the Christmas rush. We came onto the shop floor around 6 o'clock to start our shift. Three guys came round the corner, and I thought it was the night crew playing a practical joke. And that's when we was confronted by a man in camouflage, wearing a balaclava, carrying knives. I saw the weapons, and then I realised it weren't a practical joke, it was serious. That's when... And you think life flashes before your eyes, and it did. One member of staff used the Tannoy system to alert colleagues. Rob is in! Rob is in! It was a normal day, Rachel, then your Tannoy went. What happened? The Tannoy announcement was quite muffled, and actually it was one of my staff trying to warn us that there were robbers in the store. Um, I, a few seconds later, I was uh, approached by a masked man uh, right. wielding a knife. At that point, I realised that I'd got 27 of my staff being held hostage in the store. The guys brought their own tools to B&Q. They brought these bolt croppers, a very large kitchen knife, a really nasty-looking machete. Now, this, this was a spear that was intact when they brought it, but they used it to assault a member of staff and it broke in half when they hit him around his head. She hit me straight away with a knife. 
know, thanks to God, you know, it didn't go more worse than this. All 27 members of staff were rounded up and the robbers stole almost £20,000. But what they didn't know was the member of staff arriving for work had seen them in the store and we were called. <laughs> Now the robbers, they made good their escape through the same hole in the fence they cut earlier. They knew where the hole was, but the police didn't. They simply couldn't get to them. In this filling station forecourt, you can actually see the back of the B&Q warehouse and the railway track. Now the robbers, they left their car over there, so what they did, they used one of the bins from the filling station forecourt itself. They pulled it across to the wall, over the top to use as a sort of ladder. They got down to the track and then across the track and attacked the back of the store itself. There, there, there they are. are. Yeah, there they are. With officers here, it meant a quick divert for the robbers. They ran the opposite way into the railway tunnel. The railway embankment's over there. Now, the robbers, they came up through this alleyway. This is part of Sheffield College. Their day was starting to go badly wrong. They were in panic. They were starting to drop containers full of cash which they'd stolen from the store. They were dropping clothing and everything that they planned was actually in the bin. We know they managed to make their way across this road here. They went over the wall into pitch darkness and from that point we lost them. I don't like to come into the store on my own and if I hear raised voices then I get flashbacks to that day. The long term effect is every time I think about it. It still upsets me. I've got colleagues who have not been able to return back to the store. I have others who are still having counselling. We're a family here at this store, and it ripped the heart out of us. Well, Andy, since all that, B&Q have updated and reviewed their security nationwide. And the good news is, two out of those three have been caught. They're behind bars. There's one left, yes. Stephen Brammer. What do you know about him? Well, he's a South Yorkshire man, a Sheffield man. He's 46, he's 5 foot 7, 5 foot 8, and he's medium build. Now, you've got yes. a good mugshot of him, because he's got previous. You yeah. know him well yes. uh, in the police fraternity. Where do you think he is now? He's got connections up and down the country, as far away as Torquay, Durham, Manchester. Uh, but the point of the appeal is, is to find him now. Where is he now? OK, well, take a good look at him. Stephen Brammer is his name, if you know him, if you've seen him. Call us here in the studio or call the instant room on 0800 387-830. A couple of years ago, Thuy Van Lee left North Vietnam for Britain to make a better life for his family. Last month, two men ended his life in a Manchester off-license. The shop is Spanish Wines in Old Trafford. Two armed robbers burst in, demanding cash. On the left of the screen, there's a struggle, and just off-camera, Thuy is shot, trying to defend himself. The killer then has a go at the till, but the pair leave empty-handed. An hour and a half later, the same two show up at the McFresh off-license in Moss Side. This time, the shopkeeper does as he's told, and they steal £160. Look at that very distinctive tracksuit top. This is Ty Van Lee, to his sister-in-law and Superintendent Martin Bottomley. And it would have been you, normally, yes, in that shop that night. Me. Yes, that's right. Have you had a lot of problems in the shop? It hasn't been open that long with you. No, we've only been there for just two months. So we don't know. Uh, we need to just get used to the, the local customer. It must have just been appalling for you. Have you been back to the shop since then? We've been back a couple of times. I've been back a couple of times because the police would be to be back there. But I just couldn't stay. We met like a few minutes and they had to leave. So you've actually closed the store now? No, the, the shop is closed now, yeah. And I gather that Twee's funeral was, what, last week, week before last? Yes. Back in Vietnam? Yes. It's been about over ten days. It a very, very, very emotional hard. affair. Yes, it's very hard. Our father collapsed and his wife. I mean, at the moment, the, the whole family has been ripped apart. It's just, it just is extraordinary the way these guys behaved. Firstly, having killed somebody, instead of covering their tracks, trying to hide the gun, then they go off and do it again. Yes, it just shows how callous and dangerous these men are and how much they need to be caught. One of them, it is an interesting issue, this. You can't really see it on that CCTV. Tries to restrain the other one, almost tries to wrestle him out of the shop. And in the second one, he's obviously not, not very keen uh, on the second offence at all. Maybe make a great deal of sense, if you're watching, for you to call before 
these guys reach you because uh, you might be able to do yourself a, a favour. But you've got all sorts of clues. This gun, this is a similar one to the one that was used, 38 calibre. Not a real gun, in other words, a sort of a, a remade one, reconditioned one. Yes, it's reactivated, but that's a very similar gun to the one used in both offences. And, and you showed the, the tracksuit top. We saw that in the CCTV. You've had one made up because you couldn't find one identical. These Absolutely. are very uh, unusual. Very unusual. We think it's actually a counterfeit Nike uh, make, but uh, we've not been able to find one, hence that one in the studio today. Well, the man with a gun is very, very dangerous indeed. If you know who he is, he's likely to do it again in the community. If you don't call us, please ring us here in the studio. We'll call the incident room on 0161 856 3691. Now, DC Jackie Hames and DS Steve Snow have a very hungry and very nasty character lined up on CCTV. Yeah, we're going to Bradford with uh, this guy, Nabby, digging into his uh, fish and chips in the driver's seat of a car. His uh, friends are in the car next to him. Um, tell us about this guy, Nabby. This is Ayaz Ahmed Nabby. He's wanted in Bradford in connection to uh, drugs and firearms offences. Uh, is, is this quite a recent picture of him? Does That's a couple of years like old, but he still looks like that, we believe. Oh, hopefully. He's quite good there. Now, he very quickly drives off because the police ar car arrives here. Um, we'll see him. There he goes, uh, driving off at speed. That's right, and if you look here in, in the bottom of the screen when we come back to there, that um, the officer stands in front of the car and uh, has to take evasive action and jump out of the way as they, as they drive at him, Crikey, trying to run him over. Very lucky, wasn't he? And in fact, they're just driving round the corner. Here they are, pulling over, and something comes flying out of the car. Yeah, that's in fact a gun that they're discarding from the car that's thrown into the bushes from the car, yes. And you've actually recovered it, and here have, it is. Thankfully. Pretty hefty old thing. Yes. Tell us about it. Well, that's a, a Mac 10 machine pistol, uh, very similar to the Uzi machine gun. Um, and as I say, when we recovered it, it had 27 live rounds of ammunition in, and it's just a lethal weapon in the wrong hands. Very frightening. Well, let's have another look at um, Nabby's car, because he may still be driving it. That's right, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a Honda Civic. And he came back to the scene? Several hours later in the daylight, he, uh, he returned to the scene to try and recover the gun from the bushes, but thankfully we'd got there first. Tell us about Nabby. Well, Nabby has a nickname of Pinky. Uh, we know that he has a gold tooth in, in his upper jaw. He originates from the Bradford area but he may have connections throughout the country. Let's have another look at that car, just for that registration number. It's N991, M for Mike, A for Alpha, E for Echo. That's correct, yeah. So if you know where he is, please call us here in the studio. Sometimes it takes just one crime for a community to make a stand against what's happening. The killing of Barrington Williams in East London may be one such crime. He was an ordinary, decent guy, on a night out with his sister and a mate. 17 shots were fired into his car outside a club in Clapton. His sister, lucky to escape the hail of bullets, then made this anguish 999 call. Don't give up a care, I love you. You're the only thing I've got, okay? You're the only thing I've got. Please don't give up. You're the only thing I've got. Please don't give up on me. I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving you, darling. His eyes are open. They're not blinking. They're not doing nothing. Don't give up. 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 The shots started firing, and all I can hear is my baby brother calling me, trying to save me more than anything else. You know, he was protecting me, didn't want me to get out. He was my son, he was a brother, he was an uncle, he was a nephew, he was a grandson. And he loved everybody in his family, and everybody loved him. 2006 may well not be here for long big part of me is gone and I don't really see a future. I don't really see how I'm going to get through the year. <laughs> Six fifteen a.m. on January the second, bank holiday, and the three were still up for action even after a night of clubbing. I thought you said you got work in the morning. Mum will kill you if you don't get to bed on time. If I go to sleep now, I'll never go to work. Come on, bro. Listen, stay in the car. We'll be back in a second. The two lads went off to see if they could still get into another club, the Palace Pavilion. Who's this bratty boy looking at? Yeah, like... Look at this. Right. Who do you think you are? Whoa, whoa, we're See, close. Come on, it's six in the morning. We're close. There was something of an altercation on the steps of the Palace Pavilion. Someone wasn't happy.
Having failed to get into the club, the two lads bought chicken takeaways and took them to the car. Right there, ma'am? Yeah. One witness describes what she thought was a handgun, but we now know it must have been an automatic. telling me now do not feel anger against these people but I hate them I have nothing but hatred in my heart for them I do not understand how these boys can walk around and take people's lives at a whim for nothing for nothing at all Barrett was 19 but he was still a baby he was our baby and I don't want this to happen to anybody else they've taken my son someone that I carried for nine months gave birth to and cared for him and loved him and nurtured him to, and tried to bring him up in a right and responsible way. For them to come and pick him off just, just like that, who are they? Who are they? Who do they think they are? Indeed, who are they? Trying to find them is D.I. Paul Gapper. This is Serena, sister Sherelle. Serena, when the shooting started, I mean, presumably you had no idea what was happening. I didn't know what was happening. He got in the car, happily and bubbly, willing to drop me home. The shots shot started firing, you know, everything went blank. It was only until everything went quiet and my brother stopped screaming that I looked up and realised that my brother had been shot. And he'd been trying to protect you. You were very close, weren't you? Yeah. Very close family. Shrey used to call him, I gather that the family used to call him Romeo, why? Um, he was a ladies' man. Um, women loved him of all ages. They just, obviously, people were impressed by his charm. He didn't have to try. He could look rough and people just flocked to him. People just warmed to him. He was never in trouble, was he? I mean, you know, he was just an ordinary, ordinary guy. That was normal, innocent, happy guy who went along and had no problems. He loved computers, women. And, you know, being time at home, basically. Man, the younger kids, that was barren. People in your community will know who did this. You've got an opportunity now to talk to them directly. Serena, what do you want to say to them? I just want to say to anyone who was out there, and I know there was a lot of people out there tonight, people I know, people I don't know. If you know anything, it's just to come forth. No one actually knows what we're going through, and no one is going to half as no until it happens to someone close to them. I just want someone to pull, like, pull together to help, to bring these people off the streets so I can actually feel safe walking with my son or sending my younger brothers to school or actually seeing other kids out there who are armed being hit by these people who have hit Barrington. Paul, I bet you so many people in the community want to see this shooting stopped are appalled themselves, but are frightened. How much can you guarantee that people who ring in tonight will remain anonymous, their names will never get out? I would say, please come forward. We'll guarantee you have an anonymity. Please trust Trident. Um, we're a Trident-tested gang, so please come forward. If you do, whatever your motives, and one motive might be, incidentally, that there's a reward of up to £20,000. Please help. Call us in the studio or call the Instant Room on 020 8733 4704. 
Well, we've had a lot of people calling us in the studio over the last 40 minutes or so on those serial knife attacks we told you about earlier. Remember in, in South West London, we've had over 40 calls and also uh, some uh, new, new victims calling in, so some very interesting information on that. Now, a late night out in Bromley in Kent turned out to be the worst possible time for a 24-year-old girl to fall out with her mates on her way home. That night we went clubbing, my friend met a guy, I was dancing so I liked to have a dance so we were just having a good time. After I came out of the club, me and my friend had an argument so I walked off in front, I thought they were behind me. But her friends weren't keeping up with her anymore. Someone else though, was. When I realised they weren't there, I phoned my friend several times. I also tried to phone my mum, but as I couldn't get hold of them, I thought it would be safer to walk on the main road. But in Westmoreland Road, the man grabbed her, put his hand over her mouth and threatened her with a knife. When he grabbed me, um, I was in shock and I couldn't believe that something like this was going to happen to me. I felt really scared and... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I just thought that I was going to die. She was dragged to a driveway in Cameron Road and raped. I feel that the guy that's done this to me, he, he makes me feel sick inside and I'm very angry. He's taken my life away from me. He's ruined it. Well, Jim, we get a very good look at this man on CCTV, don't we, following her there down Bromley High Street. Yes. What can you tell us about him? He's aged between 32 and 35 years of age. He's approximately 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 11. His clothing is a white beanie hat, a red jumper white trainers, blue denim jackets. Perhaps more importantly, most, most importantly, we have this man's DNA. People may be scared to offer names up to the police. By means of a very simple test, we can eliminate innocent people from this inquiry. So if they have any suspicions at all, yes, they should ring all. in tonight. And, and also, he was seen earlier on, wasn't he, at Bromley South train station. Uh, the girl was making a phone call, and he was seen watching her. It was late, but there were people around, so there may be witnesses that you want to call in tonight. Yeah, nearby there is a taxi rank. A club had emptied out close by. People may have been waiting for taxis. We would urge taxi drivers, people driving by, people waiting for cabs, anyone at all who knows this man to call us. OK, Jim, thanks very much. As you have, there's DNA, so if you have any suspicions at all as to who this might be, call us here in the studio or call the incident room on 0208 284 8774. If you've been the victim of crime, you can call victim support on 0845 30 30 900. Now, Jackie and Rav are hoping you can help them with their latest lineup. 18 year old Fasil Hussain is wanted in connection with the stabbing of Kashif Mahmood in Ilford last September. Kashif died as a result of the attack. He was just 16 years old. Hussein has a slim build, he's 5 foot 5, and has links in North East London and Birmingham. There is a £20,000 reward. Jamaican born Michael McFarlane is wanted by Sussex police on suspicion of dealing in crack cocaine. He failed to appear at court in April 2004 and has still not been traced. He's known to frequent South Norwood in London and Brighton. He's five foot ten and has a slight Jamaican accent. This time last year, this character bit the ear off a doorman in New York City centre. Brett Lill turned up at court in April and pleaded guilty to wounding, but he didn't stick around for the sentence. He jumped out of the dock and escaped from York Crown Court, and he's not been seen since. And 48-year-old Imran Sheikh is wanted in connection with sex offences against a mentally disordered woman. He jumped bail last year and Bradford police are keen to track him down. He was born in Pakistan but is an Austrian national. He's fairly tall, he's got a soft Asian accent and if you get to see him without a shirt, look out for a scar on the right side of his stomach. If you've seen any of those faces, please call us here in the studio 0500 600 600. The death of 17-year-old Jack McLeod turned the family Christmas into a catastrophe. It's left them and Warwickshire Police asking the same question. How did the happy lad on a night out with friends end up at the bottom of a river? Every mother and father loves their children and thinks they're really good. 
and you only hope that they're as good as you think they are. I knew that he touched more than I really knew. The hole that he's going to leave is massive. I do now believe that Leamington lost their young man as well, a good young man, who was going to be a very good older man. Saturday night, usually I'd be doing something, Jack would be doing something. We'd always be with each other through the day, but it was just, you know, we both had nothing on that night, so we decided to go into town. I actually just went into the ocean bar, uh, not planning on meeting Jack, uh, but I happened to see him in there with Sean. <laughs> Do you want another drink? Yeah, why not, thanks. Uh, can we have two pints, please? Yeah, I do, come on, please, chat. I, I've left it at home. Right, your friends, have you got any ID? I haven't got any on me. I need see ID off both of you if I'm going to serve you, gents. I can't believe I'm afraid. A lot of his friends were older, not older, because he was the youngest in his class. They could all get out on Saturday night and get in places. Let's be honest, that's the real world we live in. You, if you're 16 and you look 18, you're going to get in. Jack had such a young face, it couldn't happen for him. I can't believe you're coming here on your night off. Yeah, I know. Jack and Sean actually work at the Irish bar. They decided it would probably be best if we went there. Uh, that's my round, that's not my thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. I'm glad you're not work tonight. Yeah. JD's up, lads. Oh, cheers, mate. JD, I can't do any that, mate. <laughs> I'll have yours then. I was just drinking quite heavily, like, getting them down quite quick and decided that I'd actually mix some of my drinks and made a turbo shandy, it's called, like, it's, uh, it's uh, the beer mixed with WKD and then just with, like, some vodka in it, but I actually put JD instead in mine, so I was on catch-up. Sean stopped drinking, really, because he was pretty drunk, but me and Jack carried on drinking the JDs, like, all through the night until we left. Me and Jack were quite drunk. I, I think Sean might have sobered up a bit because he didn't really drink towards the end of the night. <laughs> there was a few nights where I seen Jack fall over a little bit. And there was a few nights, you know, where I seen him and he was fine. You know, there was nothing to, there was nothing to concern me to think um, he was in a that bad a state. Jack fell over it on the bridge. Just, he didn't really seem to want to get up. Um, me and Sean were trying to carry him. To no success, really, he, f he fell back down and just wasn't seemed to get up no matter how much we tried. Mark, look, lads, I can't take this tonight, lads. I'm going to have to go, I can't take it. See you later. Sean got his voice together and just walked off, just left me and Jack on the top of the bridge. I managed to stand him up and he picked him up over my shoulder and kind of gave him a fireman's lift down the path. I must have went for a good 25 something yards or so like down the path and I just couldn't carry him anymore. I can't actually remember whether we fell over or if he dropped off me. Come on, we've got to get home. I tried a number of times. Uh, at one point, it's as though Jack's kind of lashed out at me and like swung for me, but I'm not entirely sure if it was like I meant to be a vicious like, like punch at me or just like pushing me away and like caught me like on the neck and the face area. But we've had a bit of a heated moment when that happened. I kind of grabbed him and I said, like, don't do that again, Jack. Get up. Get up. Listen, mate. Don't hit me again. Oh, God. He, he was just basically like, go away, like. And so at that point, I did. I arranged to meet my mates at Viali's. Had a good night? Yeah, it's been all right. I was quite eager to go back and help Jack out because obviously yeah, he was left on his yeah. own. He was in a bit of a state and he needed our help, really. Walked back over the bridge and up towards where I remember I leaving Jack. Yeah. Uh, when we did eventually get there, uh, we couldn't see him anywhere. We, we had a little look round, like, had a quick scan for him, like... Jack? Jack? We couldn't see him. We can't, I guess we kind of just figured that he managed to get up and do something for himself, like... So we just assumed that he was all right. Yeah, my memory, to be, like, to be honest, like, I'm quite annoyed about it, to be honest, because the main, the main, like, the most important parts that I should remember is when it was just me and Jack, and they're the most, they're the one fuzziest on. I'm not 100% on, like, a lot of the things, like, that happened in that space of time, 
and even some things just I've completely blanked out my mind that I just I can't remember like We'd just been out in Coventry and we decided to come home roughly about two o'clock. We pulled up and we had a disagreement with him about the fare. We started to walk over the bridge and suddenly we heard it was like um, a howling or a screaming. It was like drunken voices, but it was frightening enough for us to run home. I've never, ever woken up not knowing where Jack was. Jack! I knocked Jack's door, opened it, and they weren't there. So I come down and I said to you, and do you know, babes, I said, they're not here. Did you get a text? And you he said, checked the phone, no. He checked his phone, no. No phone, no missed call. So then, I remember saying to Ewan, give Sean a ring. Ewan just said to me, is Jack with you? And I said, no, um, I last left him with Mark. So I told Ewan that I'd phone Mark to see if Jack was with, um, with him. Uh, that was kind of when the panic started happening, like, that I realised, obviously, he didn't go home. Even at that very stage, I knew I knew something drastically was wrong. I said, Sheena, I'm going to have to go, and I'm going to, and I went on foot, because if I went on a car, I wasn't going to be able to. Look. I even started looking at the end of, before the windmill, round the back of the garages, uh, across the road. I, I looked under the bushes, in alleyways that I didn't even know existed. And I remember screaming, oh my God, somebody's hurt him. And I knew, I knew that I'd lost him. And then I started go going down the river and towards the Adelaide Bridge. I didn't even know it was called Adelaide Bridge then. And just kept walking and thinking, oh my God, you've gone in the river. When Jack's mother reported him missing, we started our inquiry here. Because this is here, here where Mark said that he'd left Jack lying half on and half off the pavement. Jack hasn't been seen since then. We commenced a search of the area very minute search of the area and we discovered down here by the bank that it had been disturbed and there was a strong possibility that Jack had entered the water at this point here. I haven't got any independent sightings of Jack since he'd been seen unconscious on the bridge at 1.35. There were two males heard screaming on the other side further downstream between 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, Jack hasn't been seen since that time, so therefore we're treating his, his death as suspicious. I knew that Jack would come back. Yeah. Because I knew he'd come back to me. I knew he would. It's not how I wanted him brought back, no. but you see, I knew. It was hard, you know, but I'm just glad they found him in the end. It was just everything you could wish for to me. You just you can't believe he's gone. It's a thing that a normal night could end in such disaster. To be honest, I wish it was me, because I've done like a lot worse things and I got myself in a lot worse state, and nothing bad like that's happened to me. Just the fact of the matter is, if I had stayed with my friend, then none of this would have happened. Someone's hiding something. <laughs> can they can they hold that guilt to themselves for the rest of their lives, knowing? <laughs> can they? Can they? It may have been. It may have been an accident, it may have been or accident or whatever. You know, you, you can't, li can't live with that. Because we need to know, we need to know. Well, Bob, Jack's parents are obviously destroyed by this. I mean, he was by the river, he was drunk. It's possibly he could have fallen in the river, but you think that's unlikely, don't you? Well, I'm receptive to the fact that it could be a tragic accident. Um, 
but the distance from where Jack was left lying on the pavement to the water's edge is too far for him just to have stumbled and fallen in. I need to establish how Jack died, and until I, I do that, I've got to treat his death as suspicious. Now, what about this noise that these two girls heard when they got out of the taxi? This howling noise that frightened them so much. Have you got any more information about that? Not at this stage. Between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., these females had just been dropped off by a taxi, um, were walking over the bridge. They heard this, these male voices howling, which upset them so much they felt they had to run. So you want to know who those men were, and also, incidentally, the taxi driver who dropped them off. Uh, because he may have heard something as well and he hasn't yet come forward. That's right. If he'd come forward, we'd like to narrow down that time frame between 2 and 3 a.m. What about other witnesses who, who, who could fill in this missing gap? The last sighting of Jack on the bridge um, from other witnesses, then he ended up down by the river on the bench. Any witnesses who may have seen him around that time, you'd like them to come forward, wouldn't yes, you? Yes, please. I've got this two to three minute time frame when at 1.32 Jack was sighted walking with his friends unaided over the bridge. Uh, and then at 1.35 a lone female motorist and a pedestrian walking by saw Jack lying apparently unconscious with his friends standing over him. You talk uh, in the reconstruction there from the riverbank where there's an area, a kind of disturbed area, you say, which is where Jack may have gone into the water. There's also branches nearby that are broken off. Anything could have caused that. But on the other hand, it could possibly be a clue. I mean, you're testing the branches for fibres, aren't you? They could be connected. There were freshly torn off branches from a nearby tree. Um, if there's an innocent explanation for those branches being there, I'd like to know about it. On the other hand, if they were used as a weapon or perhaps in a kind of failed attempt to get Jack out of the river. You want to know about that too? I need to establish that fact, yes. OK, well, Bob, thanks very much. If you have any information at all just to help Jack's parents, call us here in the studio or call the Instant Room on 01926 415622. We've had a really good response to all cases tonight, so thank you to each and every one of you that has called in. Now, we've had a really good response on the uh, outstanding suspect that we're looking for, and that B&Q robbery that we showed you earlier today. Now, some callers have asked to see that picture again, so hopefully we'll be able to show you that. His name is Stephen Brammer. Have a good look. Some guys think they've seen him. Have you? Where is he tonight? Let us know. We also had a massive response on the ones with knife attack. We're approaching 50 calls now on that, and it's rising all the time. And we've also had victims of other, we believe, linked offences that have come forward as well. We've also had several names suggested for him. We've got to catch that guy. Now, listen, just because Crime Watch is coming to a close tonight doesn't mean the lines are. They're very much still up and running and open. You know anything, please do. Get on that phone and give us a call. Before we finish the main programme, let's see if you can help lift the spirits of some rather deflated kids in Gloucestershire. Last October, a 14-foot trailer, this one was stolen from an industrial estate in Stroud. Now, it's not much to look at as a trailer, but it's what it contained that's important, a unique inflatable circus slide, and a big one. When fully blown up, it's 22 feet high and 15 feet wide. Police are also on the lookout for a helter-skelter, along with five crash mats, and three generators. Now we think this white Ford Transit van was used to take the trailer away. It looks like uh, like a 1990s model. So if you see anyone in possession of a big circus slide or a helter skelter, well, somebody's got them. Remember, these inflatables are one of a kind. So give us a call. Details of the slide, the helter skelter, and everything else we've talked about tonight are on our website at pbc.co.uk/crime. Our phone lines are open until midnight tonight, and then from 7:30 until midnight tomorrow. We're back after news with Crime Watch update at 10.35. Later in Wales, join us if you can. Crime Watch next month is on Wednesday, February the 22nd. Whatever happens, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. For now, good night. Good night. Our viewers in Northern Ireland can see tonight's Crime Watch UK updates at 5 past 11 here on BBC One.